As my plane is about to land, I flip through my research files and find an early plan for transforming Toronto into a 3MF city. It's the year 2060, and Toronto is on the cutting edge of the 3MF revolution. I'm the director of urban farming in Moscow, where we've just experienced our first food shortages, so I've decided to come to Toronto to see how 3MF works here, in a cold climate city just like mine. As darkness falls, the city glows green. At night, the bioreactors are lit artificially with wide-spectrum LEDs. Algae are a tough plant that can sustain the 24-hour growth cycles. It wasn't until Toronto detoxified its bio-waste that they were rediscovered as streams packed with nutrients and fertilizers for plants. Shortly after, algae farming exploded onto the urban scene, fed by Toronto's own bio-wastes, collected sunlight, and CO2 leached from the city's air. As I wake up, I roll back the curtains of my hotel room window and catch my first view of the glistening surfaces of hybrid solar concentrators that are used to focus sunlight and transport it via fiber optics through the outer skin of buildings and into microcrop farms on the inside. Solar-generated electricity and now pure sunlight have become the, become the lifeblood running through the arteries of this city. Today I am touring Ontario Place, an experimental 3MF community for people willing to give up old lifestyles and invest in one that tries to find a more ethical way to coexist on this planet. I enter through a glazed tunnel that passes through a restaurant pavilion. Inside I see people eating all kinds of insect foods. I still don't get how people can eat insects, but then again 25 years ago I'd cringe the thought of eating raw fish. And today I love sushi. As we begin our tour with the architect of this tower, she starts to explain that mixed-use and 3MF have a symbiotic relationship. 3MF operations feed off of building wastes like grey water and exhausted air, and a building housing a community that lives and breathes 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, all year round, provides an uninterrupted source of these type of wastes and exhausts. As we exit the elevator, my feet touch grass and I look up to be amazed. We join a small class of kids whose teacher is the building's urban farmer. He explains that they grow aqua crops like algae and terra crops like grass, vines, and shrubs, which are all used to produce green biomass for the micro livestock farms. We enter the building's micro livestock hatchery, which contains all the processes required to turn micro livestock into edible meat. To euthanize the crickets, the temperature in the incubator is lowered to the point that they fall asleep and then further until they freeze. From there, the insects go directly to the protein processing plant, where while the insects are still fresh, they are processed into protein powder. Our last stop on the tour is the local food market on the ground floor of the building. The architect tells me they are always experimenting with new species of insects and new recipes. The neat thing about Toronto is that many of the small communities have their own experimental cuisines. As we leave Ontario Place and walk back through the restaurant pavilion, I come across this year's winning recipe for the UN's World Food Ration Contest. It's a single cookie that meets an adult's nutritive and calorie requirements for a day. Price tag? Two cents. I pick up a cookie and take a bite. And as I do, new guests that are just entering the park look at me in disbelief as I eat my first insect food.